Hello and welcome to After Scientology Straight Up and Vertical, the weekly show where Tony Ortega and I get together and we just rap about Scientology as reported on Tony's Substack over the past week. A lot of interesting stuff this week. Tony, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Chris. Let's have some fun. Yeah, let's do it. Um, there's, you know, there's fun, interesting stuff going on. First off, uh, to kind of follow up on what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, there was an ideal org opening this week. We should talk about it. This was Chicago. Uh, what happened? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because there finally has been some media coverage of that in Chicago from the main papers there uh, a little after the fact, but they're getting it right. I mean, they, 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 you know, quoting people like Claire Headley and understanding that this is that there's something strange about Scientology opening an ideal org there now. And again, I'll tell it like I do all the time. The only reason Chicago got an ideal org this week has nothing to do with the demand there or, or, you know, what Scientology is doing. It's just that David Miscavige wanted to have the grand opening on his schedule. He had opened two others previously uh, in Austin, Texas and Mexico city and this was the date he had, he had chosen to go in there and have this grand opening. Uh, as usual, they try to uh, shade it for the local environment. So uh, for the Chicago Ideal Org, they literally had a band dressed like the Blues Brothers go up and open things up with the with the rendition of Soul Man. Um, you know, it, it's it was uh, the usual dog and pony show. Of course, what we're always very interested in. A couple basic facts. It's it's right downtown on a building that that is a very nice, interesting building. Uh, they'd had it forever, something like 16 years. It sat there empty, rotting. Um, they finally cleaned it up. I'm sure it looks really nice inside now. Um, but it's like all the other ideal orgs. It'll open to fanfare. They'll work really hard for a year to make it work, and then it'll just die. Um this uh what we are very interested always in these ceremonies though is who can david miscavige attract to make some speeches and they did manage to get one former elected official this guy rob fioretti who apparently had been an alderman for a couple of terms two four-year terms excuse me and has run for mayor unsuccessfully. I don't know if it says anything, but apparently he had run as a Democrat forever. And then just in the last year and a half or so, he switched to Republican. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything. Sounds like he's been kind of an ally of theirs for a long time. Uh, he sort of defended his participation to the Sun-Times afterwards. Um, the other three were just African-American activists of some sort. Uh, talking about the usual as far as human rights and, you know, helping out in the pandemic and all that silly stuff. So, you know, again, they really are not uh, able to bring in the big names like they did before. Remember, they had Congressman Rangel at the New York New Ideal Org opening. They had Mayor Kevin Johnson, NBA star, at their Sacramento Ideal Org uh, opening. But that was years ago. It's gotten tougher for them. So, just a little fanfare, a quick little ceremony, and now they do have their Chicago Ideal Org, which I'm sure you will agree with me, will have zero impact on Chicago going forward. Yeah, big time. I uh, think that I actually spent a day in that Chicago building uh, before it was all renovated and everything. I was on a recruitment tour through Chicago, we were doing a big event for the Midwest Ideal Org thing. And this was, well, over 10 years ago at this point, uh, 12 years ago, I imagine. And um, got one guy who signed up for the Sea Org there. <laughs> one guy, there were like 50 people in the room. They got one guy. And he'd never even like, I think he did, I think he was on his first course or something. I mean, it was, I guess I'm trying to get across that Chicago is not a big field of Scientologists, never has been. Certainly I can confirm this is not because of public demand. And the staff there were cookie cutter of every other place you go, old school, most of them around since the seventies, you know, or second gen of families. That's who keeps these orgs together and keeps the doors open at them is kind of that sort of class of of Scientologist. And uh, Chicago was, you know, no different. It was East U.S. rather than West U.S. for me. But um, 
Also, I'm a little curious if there's an NOI connection with some of the speakers and stuff they're getting lately because of the, do you think? My observer, uh, I had a helper that was going by for years, keeping an eye on the place for us. Very, very valuable helper. And he, when the ceremony began, he told me he had only seen one Nation of Islam person. Okay. So it sounds like there wasn't a Nation of Islam uh, presence, uh, if or if there was, it wasn't very noticeable. Okay. Okay. I got asked about that in a and a this week, and I was kind of like, huh, I wonder how much that plays in Chicago. Cause I'm that's not a... sure what that relationship's like anymore. I, I know that yeah. there's still some hardcore Nation of Islam people that got high on the bridge. But I think the larger thing may, I'm not sure what that, yeah, that's a good question. We should keep an eye out for that. Yeah, it's an interesting connection still. And 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 what and the point that came up is just how divergent the mythologies are. Yeah, yeah. They are way different, you know. All right. Um now moving on to the next story we should cover here and this is uh just becoming noisier is the East Grinstead Town Council and uh, and Alex's actions over there. Man, he's been making a ruckus and then this week there was a, a maybe coincidental what what happened? Yeah, so, you know, Alex Barnes-Ross um, was inspired by the return of David Miscavige to East Grinstead for the IAS um, event in November, and he held a three-day protest, and in, in to do that, he had to request permissions for some street closers uh, or at least some police presence. And ever since then, it's just been chaos in East Grinstead as he's been asking pointed questions about why the town council there seems to be so in bed with Scientology. And he's made some requests. He made some records requests for some emails that I wrote about for him. Uh, really interesting to show how some of the local politicians really leaped into the breach to help Scientology out. So there's no question... And it makes sense, Chris, because you've got one of Scientology's most important locations, the St. Hill UK headquarters, in a relatively small town, and it's been there for, you know, 50 years. So there's lots of probably a long time for Scientology to work on those local officials. And I think part of what's going on is that, you know, the, the English press is more focused on places like London. They just, it, it, you know, somebody going in there and asking questions is really having a big effect. And to the point where, you know, um, he he had um, made some records requests about town council meetings, town council minutes, blah, blah, blah. We were hearing that behind the scenes, all of this was causing chaos and that officials were angry with each other about how it was all being handled. This is some of the stuff that was getting out to her second or third hand. Well, then this week, one of the city town council councilors resigned. And, of course, we're very, very curious because Alex has heard that it's directly related and he's very unhappy with how the other councils are handling all this. But that he's going to float maybe a, you know, health reasons excuse. But then as Alex uh, explained, the way it works over there, a little different than the United States, he this this guy is not only on the town councils, but he's on some regional councils as well. And if he comes out and says, I can't be on the town council anymore for health reasons, then they're going to ask him, then why are you still on these regional councils? So he probably isn't going to say that at all. So we may not get an exp explanation officially from this guy, but there is, you know, we've heard that it was related. He's unhappy with the way these councilors are handling all this Scientology stuff. So I think I think Alex is having a direct effect on that town and what's going on. And I think more is coming. So I've been really interested in working with him on that. Big time, big time. Alex has been very exciting with what he's been doing over there. Shaking the trees, basically, right? Making some noise and making something happen on official government channels and lines and getting the media involved as well. And that's, you know, if you're going to do this, I'm just going to say that's how you do it, you know, is, is, is you really, is you, is you ask the uncomfortable questions in the places where it matters and you, and, and to the people that it matters to ask those questions too, you know, in a way that, that they're trying so hard right now. It's very apparent to me as, as an outsider, um, you know, how much of a shuffle dance they're doing, trying to like yeah. stay away from this Scientology topic because they've gotten a free pass for a couple decades now. 
and now they're not, and it's suddenly a problem. And look at their kerfuffle uh, resulting. So uh, keep going, Alex. All right. So uh, okay. Now speaking of uh, government officials, Scientology. Mark Bunker, Clearwater race for city council, and what's the story here? So, you know, um, early voting's already started, but election day is still a week away. And I remember uh, Mark complaining um, a couple of months ago that his signs had gone missing, his yard signs. And in a local election like that, he's he's been on the city council for four years, and he's He's vice mayor right now, but he's just running for re-election on the city council. Uh, somebody else, other people are running for mayor. Um, you know, in that kind of a local race, yard signs in America, unfortunately, are are pretty important. Not so much in other parts of the world, apparently. But in the United States, you, you want to have a lot of yard signs for a, for a position like that. And he had paid for quite a few of them, but they had disappeared. And uh, Tracy McManus at the Tampa Bay Times wrote a great story that came out, I think, Wednesday night or Thursday night, um, saying that um, somebody had a video from their ring camera on their door that actually caught, showed these two guys picking up Mark signs and leaving the others alone. And that's the key, that it's clearly that they're targeting him for some reason. And the police managed to get either from that video or another one an angle on the car to get a license plate number. That led them to the registered owner, who turned out to be the father of the kid that was out doing this. And he and another two 30-year-olds admitted that they were the ones that had done that. They were Scientologists. Apparently, this was just, you know, they were offended to hear that Mark Bunker was an anti-Scientologist and running for mayor. They thought he was running for mayor. He's not. And so they went out and, and pulled his signs. Um, I just thought it was a real classy move that when the police went to Mark Bunker with all this, he he declined to press charges. The The two young guys are, are play, claiming they're going to pay him for the signs that they stole. And Tracy McManus, because there were no charges, didn't identify them in the story. So I think it was handled really well. I think ultimately it, it's going to backfire against Scientology because it gave Mark all this publicity just a week before Election Day and hopefully reminds the people of Clearwater why it's a good idea to have him in there. So I had him on my podcast and I wanted him to go over again because to me, a lot has changed in the four years since he got in there. And, and Clearwater has really made very good strides at dealing with Scientology's presence. They're trying to create more life downtown yeah. by ignoring Scientology. They built an amphitheater. They've got some apartments coming in. And, you know, Mark has been there to make sure that Scientology doesn't mess with the process. So I think it's really important that they re return him to that office. We'll see. Like I said, election is a week from Tuesday. Okay, excellent. Well, I certainly hope anybody who's listening out here from Clearwater will give Mark your vote. Uh, I certainly endorse him. Uh, he's a good guy. He's sincere. I've, I've, you know, I've been watching his uh, activities. I mean, hell, he's been involved in this way longer than me. He goes all the way back to the Lisa McPherson trust days, and that's it, as OG as it gets. So go, Mark. Um, Okay, and then we have an uh, update on legal, and this one being this racketeering oh, yeah. charge. Uh, this is in one of the lawsuits from the Jane Doe's against um, against Masterson. And what's what's the update on this? Right, so this is the Bixler lawsuit. This is the one filed by Danny Masterson's victims against <clears throat> Danny and the church right. over harassment initially. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was filed in 2019 before there were actually any criminal charges against Danny. And this lawsuit was basically on hold the whole time that Danny was on trial criminally, which resulted in his conviction and his sentencing, and he's in prison serving 30 years to life. That allowed this lawsuit to get going again. And again, initially, the lawsuit was just about harassment. These women say that since they came forward to the LAPD in 2016, they've been followed, surveilled, hacked, their pets have been killed. I mean, all this crazy stuff that's in this wild lawsuit that was on hold for a long time. Now it's going again. Scientology's trying to derail it 
by filing uh, some motion to strikes and uh, motions to strike and motions of uh, anti-slap, basically belittling the lawsuit, saying, "Listen, if there was any harassment going on, it had nothing to do with us. You can't prove it." Blah blah blah. So that's that was uh, heard in a hearing in February, February thirteenth, I believe, and the judge has still not ruled on that. In the meantime, in December, once again, once the lawsuit got going again, the plaintiffs, the victims, the women, the Jane Doe's, asked the judge leave to file a new version of the lawsuit. They have a completely new version of this thing. It adds a victim, uh, Trisha Vesey, the actress who testified in the first trial. It adds battery, you know, sexual battery charges against Danny. So it's not just about the intimidation and stalking. It's about literally the sexual assaults, which have now been proven in court, by the way. Yep, yep. And the most interesting, they add racketeering counts, civil RICO, and say in the new version of the lawsuit, Scientology is a criminal enterprise and we're going to prove it. Really fascinating. And that made... Uh, big news in December when it came out. But again, they're asking the judge permission to make that change. That's yep. scheduled for March 20th. Okay. So now Scientology has filed its opposition. And that's what I was writing about in at the Substack this week. I was quoting from it to show you Scientology is saying, hey, hey, first of all, they called it names, of course, because they're writing for David Miscavige. They called it tabloid esque. Um, but they're also saying you haven't ruled on our motions yet. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't let them change the lawsuit when we don't even know if there's a lawsuit left yet. <laughs> and I have to say, they have a point. This judge needs to make up his mind about some things. Yeah. And they also said, they also said, uh, not only have you not ruled on those motions, but even if you did it like tomorrow we're probably going to appeal your ruling and you still can't change the lawsuit at that point. So uh, it's basically some, again, as so many of these lawsuits, it happens to so many of these lawsuits filed by ex Scientologists, it's all caught up in legal technicalities and not really the merits of the case. But Judge Upinder Kalra needs to make some decisions soon. And then, like I said, on March 20th, you've got this hearing scheduled where he will address this idea of a, of allowing them to add all these changes to the lawsuit. I think the weakest thing that Scientology said was complaining that oh it's been 4 years. How can they how can they change a lawsuit now? As it, you know, well well remember the whole case was on hold for 2 years because you know, it's it's always they're always just complaining and screeching about things that don't make sense. But it but the, the judge does need to make some decisions about things. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We need some process happening here. Um, because, of course, it's going to be this is exactly the kind of thing we talk about all the time. How do they delay it? How do they keep it going for years? How does it just go on and on and on with the lawyer's fees? This is how we're, we're literally showing it to you step by step. Right. That's what I like about tracking it this way as we really do get it uh, down to that detail. Um, so we're very, I'm very much looking forward to seeing this March 20th and seeing what the, if, if the judge issues uh, some judgment before that on these other matters. Um, but I'm most excited about the idea of the racketeering, <laughs> to be honest with you. I'm, I'm very pumped about that. Uh, all right. Well, those are the stories we wanted to cover for this last week. As far as where Scientology is at right now, I think we got a pretty good picture of where things are at. So with all that, Tony, uh, any sort of previews or anything you want to give for this coming up week? Well, we're recording this on Sunday afternoon, but by the time you post this on Monday afternoon, the big news should be out yeah. that Phil Jones has put up another billboard. But this time, I think it's better than before. It's really got a great message, and it's all for the Aftermath Foundation. And uh, it's the location's incredible. It's right on the block with Big Blue in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It asks people, if you're, ha if you're having trouble leaving Scientology, give us a call. It's very clear, has a clear phone number, and it goes to the Aftermath Foundation. So I, I just think it's an amazing thing that Phil 
who Phil and Willie Jones had put up three billboards in the past, and now they put up another billboard for the Aftermath Foundation, and I'm really excited about that. So that by the time you put this video up, people should already be buzzing about that. <laughs> big time, big time. This is really in your face move, by the way, because I know exactly where this is. It's right across the street from uh, the pack base Big Blue buildings. It's not down the road where the other billboards were, which was a great position. This is so much better. I mean, no Sea Org member in PAC is going to be able to ignore this sign. I'm just telling right. you straight. And ahead. and the uh, the previous ones had a really nice design. It said "Call me," and it would grab your attention. But you'd kind of have to look close to figure out that it was about Scientology, which is fine. It draws people in. This one's much more in your face. It's like I try to leave Scientology. Give us a call. You know. <laughs> so it's uh, very very smart, and um, I just think they're really brave to do this. And I'm just I'm just really glad this is going to benefit the Aftermath Foundation. Me too. Big time. I, in, in case there was any question, the Aftermath Foundation absolutely is a group worth supporting. And uh, and I'm, I'm my full endorsement there. All right, folks. Uh, thank you very much for coming around and watching us uh, gabber on at a mad rate about all of this. We will see you guys next week. Oh, subscribe to Tony Substack. Get your notifications. All right. Bye-bye.